Hello friends, it's uh, 11 o'clock Redmond time, but uh, apparently we were starting late today and I forgot to mention that last time, whatever. And uh, yeah, we have a uh, whole bunch of things and not enough time to get through them this meeting. But that's great, just means we get to have a meeting again next week. All right, um, so yes, uh, guten morgen, good often. Guten Abend, you know, wherever you are, whatever time it is. I'm too tired to think about things. First up, uh, Jason Serializer, allow out of order reading of metadata properties 72604. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so if you could click to the at the first link, there should be an API proposal. So this is one of the most highly requested features for System Text JSON, uh, extending the polymorphism feature that got shipped in uh, .NET 7. Uh, now, the problem is that as shipped originally, and uh, in order to cater to streaming serialization scenario, uh, we added a rule that mandated that metadata properties should be placed at the beginning of the object. Um, it's not something that we could change by default because changing that behavior by default would result in over buffering. So the idea here being uh, that we let users opt into that behavior in case they have schemas where, for example, uh, the type discriminator is at the very end of the object. Uh, and that enables out of order reading of metadata, of course, at the risk of over buffering. What happens when we support schema? Um, so it's um, the component that reads metadata is shared among all the features that read and write metadata in system text JSON. So reference preservation, polymorphism, they all uh, delegate to that same component. So assuming we add schema in the, in the future, uh, its semantics would be governed by the same behavior as well. So if the schema, if dollar schema is not at the beginning, Again, we would ask users to enable that flag. And it would just work. But that does it mean that like for things like that, I, I don't know about schema, but presumably you could do schema validation as you go. That would make it a lot harder, right? Because now you have to read the entire payload to find the schema to do the rest of the validation, right? Yeah. But I guess that's um, just the for, nature of this thing. Yeah. For what it's worth, the same problem exists with polymorphism. like. Uh, if the type discriminator is at the very end of the property, um, you need to find that, read that, determine mm -hmm. the runtime type, and then move the cursor back to the beginning of your first non-metadata property and start deserializing. So, uh, right. you know, it's it's going to buffer. Yeah, that makes sense. And I presume that's the reason we want to make it opt-in because it does have Curve impact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's conceivable that in certain scenario, like uh, if, for example, you're uh, reading like a huge JSON object uh, from a stream, uh, it could conceivably throw out of memory exception. Yeah. Any other comments? Any feedback on the name of the property itself? I'm, I'm curious what, what percentage of folks that use polymorphism are going to have to turn this on. Uh, based on just the number of upvotes in the issue, I would assume a substantial number, like especially people who, you know, don't write the data that they read. Assuming that you read the data that you wrote via system text JSON, this is not an issue. But, you know, clearly when you're in the web, uh, there exist certain cases where, you know, the type discriminator is not at the very beginning of the payload. So I couldn't give you a number, but I think that many people would turn that on. Like, are we going to end up turning this on for the are, we have those set of defaults, right? We have that, and we have that web defaults. Are we going to turn this on as part of the web defaults? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I, don't realize, think so. I realize there's there's a security aspect, but like it seems like 
the only reason this isn't true by default is because we're concerned about buffering in some cases when we weren't previously? Is that a fair statement? Yeah. I mean, the question is also why does post, I mean, presumably when you write this thing, we write our dollar type as the first thing, right? So presumably the reason yeah. why the order is as it is here is because Postgres doesn't store this text, but some thing where the keys are sorted by hash or something. Yeah. So presumably that is not a super common thing in the sense that I think the vast majority of storage solutions, you get back what you put in, in which case, you know, we write dollar type first and then, you know, you get it back first. So you shouldn't have to turn it on. I mean, it could be many reasons. Like you might be writing a Kafka consumer, for example, and like you're consuming events. Uh, there's no way you might necessarily control how these were written in, in the topic. So I, I can think of like loads, loads and loads and loads of scenario where this would be a valid flag to turn on. I mean, yeah. the reason I say this for polymorphism, I mean, I think the only reason why you would have dollar type is if .NET produced it, right? Uh, not not necessarily, uh, but the the name the name of the property isn't important. You can configure that obviously, um, but the what is important is the position of the property. So you're saying there's non.NET producers that emit type information? Yeah, now uh, like if you're if you're serializing an event schema, if you're doing like event sourcing or anything like that, uh, it's very likely that you have an event type field, for example, in in the events that you're sending out. And you know, if it so happens that whoever is producing these events uh, isn't putting the the event type property at the very beginning, then you know, uh, system taxation blows up at the moment. I'm just, I'm just concerned. I, name of the property aside, that more folks are going to have to set this than not. And while I realize there are buffering concerns, the default seems like we might be choosing, prioritizing for something. But at the end of the day, people are going to turn it on anyway, and then we have no control as well. So, so, so here, here's a thought that I had. Like, I speculate that uh, for ninety-eight percent of use cases. The payloads are so small that over buffering isn't an issue. Like in most cases, you, you know, the uh, the the full payload will be less than the default buffer size that we specify in JSON serialized options, which is 16k at the moment. Uh, so, uh, like 90, 98 or 99 percent of users wouldn't be impacted by this being the default behavior. Uh, the the only way, the only reason why we're not turning it on by default is for fear of regression of, you know, that outlier use case where, where they are currently, you know, streaming five gigabytes of JSON uh, and, you know, suddenly they're buffering the entire payload because of that reason. Um, and, you know, for what it's worth, we have customer reports about, you know, uh, we recently fixed a bug in system like JSON where uh, one part of the converter was accidentally buffering and that was causing their uh, deserialization logic to blow up. So it's, it's, it's something that I think by default, we shouldn't be over buffering. Like if people don't use custom converters, if people use kind of the built in stuff, uh, it should be having good streaming uh, deserialization properties. Uh, Steven, are you just objecting to it not being the default? Or do you have a proper uh, do you have a problem with exposing a property at all? Hey, I'm concerned that this isn't on by default, it feels like the things that and what we've heard is that people expect it. And so there, we're going to start to see everyone is just setting it, at which point we could have made it the default. I don't object to having a fail safe to say it's actually causing me problems. I need to disable it. Um, although that seems like it would be a real rarity. I mean, one thing we could be doing, I mean, I don't think, I mean, ignoring what, what Eric is just saying, like, I mean, I think it's easier for us to turn it on by default than to turn it off by default later, right? Because then you take away behavior versus now you're allowing more things to go through usually. So, I mean, we could start with just exposing the property and then later on decide that we also make it the default. Um, that would be safer than shipping the property and turning it on by default because taking that back seems harder. 
yeah, it's something we could try based on feedback. Uh, obviously, it would be a breaking change. I mean, it also yeah, seems I mean, like this status easy. is easier to diagnose and get a better exception message than yeah. oom, and now you look up, I'm deserializing Jason, and I got an oom. Oh, go set this thing to, I have a compliant message, don't be stupid. So, so question, like, the over-buffering... We can't actually oom, right? There's there's a limit somewhere, right? Correct. So what is the overbuffering concern? Okay, it won't oom if you if you didn't say it, DOS myself, right? It'll say like you have to like increase the limit in order to hit this problem. Sorry, I'm not sure I follow. It like is the old buffering concern a concern about like the performance being slightly worse in the case where the property isn't first or is oh, it a security concern such that people that if we turn on by default i can send a request to your server and like take it down because, okay, because so our, I our default limits are bad i don't think it's a security concern as such because you know the buffer grows linearly with respect to the payload being sent by you know, the user or the attacker in that case. So I don't think there's a security dimension to that, uh, well, but there, there's definitely a performance angle to it. Um, and just judging by- Is there a maximum size? Say again? Is there a maximum size configurable on the JSON serializer to say don't buffer past this amount, just blow up? Uh, it's array.max value. Uh, I'm sorry, array.max length. That is a concern. You like, this cannot be on by default. If I can send a payload, that can cause the server to allocate like a giant ass buffer without any control. So I would say there should be a second flag that controls the maximum amount we would ever buffer. For what it's worth, as it stands, um, the it could allocate up to and including the max length uh, if, for example, you're using a custom converter because when you have custom converters, you don't have async, so the, the serializer would need to pre-buffer everything before you know passing on control to the custom converter. So that's a concern today. I see. But, okay, but let's go back. Let's ignore the default for a second. Are we generally okay with the proposed API shape and having a property? In... I think nobody's opposing that part, right? I hear no objections. Yeah, so that means, okay, I think we're happy with the name. We're happy with having it. Now, I think the only sticking point is can we make it the default? And then what happens if we get it wrong? I mean, you know, for this city, this is going to be out in preview one. So we have several previews time to change our mind one way or the other. So in that sense, I think I'm fine. I think for David's concern, it sounds like we need to review that more generally with the serializer though. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, like I agree with Stephen, like I don't like properties when the expectation is the vast majority of people have to write code to make their shit work. Um, I'm not sure that it's the vast majority though. It will be a lot of people, but I think percentage wise, I would, I would think it's less than 10%. Yeah, you know, one thought that I did have when working on the prototype was that, you know, uh, this could only control behavior in the case of streaming serialization and it would just be the default when you do non-streaming when you deserialize from a read-only span or what have you but my concern around that is that you would then have inconsistent semantics as to what the acceptable contract is so yeah yeah okay and that one we shouldn't do I, 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 I think it's okay to say you have different performance characteristic you know whether you go streaming or from a fixed buffer, but I would not change this, the JSON you accept. That seems bad. Especially because, you know, depending on where you are in the stack, you might not control how the stuff is being read, right? 
So suddenly something that seems innocuous at some layer of the stack now has behavior implications of what JSON payload you accept. All right, so we then just say API approved and just leave the, for the feedback. Yep. Thank you. Does the BCL flip the flag in case you want the default to be false, right? Um, or do you say I, default to true sometimes? Yeah, I mean, sometimes the negation is so weird that we just accept that the default is true. I mean, for overloads, it's nicer if they're the default value, but that's not always achievable in order to okay. have it useful. <clears throat> All right. Attribute model for feature APIs. That sounds pretty generic. Uh, niner 685 Niner. I can describe this one. Should I go ahead? Go for it. Uh, so this is uh, motivated by an existing feature that we call feature switches, which allows trimming to remove uh, unused uh, code branches. And we use that to get rid of warnings from those unused code branches when they're um, incompatible with trimming or dynamic code for native AOT. Uh, and currently, this setting this up requires defining an XML file that gets embedded into the library. And the XML file says, treat this property as false when this feature uh, string is passed to the linker or native AOT. So the idea behind this proposal is to make that whole experience easier uh, by encoding what's currently in the XML via this, this attribute system. Um, and it's heavily taken the ideas from Emo's capability analyzer draft. If, uh, folks have seen that one before. It's the same kind of idea. So the idea is um, what we want to do is be able to add attributes to things to say that a given public, uh, or sorry, a given static Boolean property should be false whenever a feature is disabled. Uh, so the proposal is um, there are two really interesting attributes, feature check attribute and feature guard attribute. Um, and the idea is if you look at the API usage, uh, for an example, uh, is dynamic code supported? If you annotate that with feature check, this is supposed to tell uh, both the trim analyzer and uh, I link and native AOT that when dynamic code is is unsupported, which is the default in native AOT, then then this uh, property returns false, and it, you can use it to guard branches to uh, you can use it to guard code that has calls to APIs annotated with requires dynamic code. Uh, so that's what feature check does. And the feature guard is similar, uh, but the there's a subtle difference. The difference is that feature check is supposed to say this property is defined by the uh, by the feature, whether dynamic code is supported on or off. Feature guard says that this this property relies, like it depends on uh, the feature being supported, but it might not be defined by it. So dynamic code compilation uh, requires dynamic code support, but uh, you know you could imagine a world where dynamic code isn't compiled like it's interpreted, um, um, so it's not defined by it. So. That's the high-level overview. So feature guard will always point to an attribute, right? Yeah. And then feature check is any type just so that you have a distinctive value? Um, the, the idea is that it's also supposed to point to an attribute. Uh, we had some back and forth on what should be used to actually represent the feature. Uh, we thought about using strings, but we on our team, we kind of thought that the attribute types make sense because we already have uh, existing attribute types for some of the features like dynamic code and reference code. Right. But this can also, uh, you know, another example is startup hook support where we turn off startup hook support in a trimmed app uh, and you would use feature guard there. And you can imagine introducing a separate fe kind of feature flag for startup hook support uh, where the current API proposal requires you to define an attribute type, something like uh, startup hook uh, requires startup hook support, and so that's that's one weirdness of the of the API. But we went with that over a string representation. And then I would expect something like <clears throat> is dynamic code compiled to really be like is dynamic code supported and some other thing. Uh, 
meaning guard is indicating something is necessary but not sufficient. Exactly. Versus check yeah, is think... the, the truth of the signal. It's identical to, yeah, exactly. And then I, I see that means if this is true, it implies this other thing as well. Yeah. And then guard is allow multiple true because it's since they're all necessary but not sufficient. Uh, they're an and condition, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So if any of the guarded, uh, any of the features on the right hand side of the guard definition is false, then the whole branch can be eliminated, and it could be multiple uh, features that it's guarding. Right. So, if the feature identified by the guard is known to be, is not known to be on, then this whole property just gets replaced with false, because you've said in in attributes, there's no way this can be true unless if this thing is off. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Okay. And do we have any other examples where we would use this for, except for? This one here? Yeah, um, I wrote down a few examples in the design detailed design that's linked, but like one example is we're working on trimming wind, uh, wind forms, and we're going to have to introduce a bunch of, I don't know how many, but we're going to have to introduce feature switches to disable things like probably design time support or um, support for extensibility via iCustom, what's it called, iCustom I type descriptor, I think, um, things like that. And we also have a number of existing use cases for these things inside of .NET Runtime, like Startup Hook, and also um, if you, you know, I, I found some more examples by searching GitHub where other libraries had defined their own feature switches too. Okay, and do you have somewhere an example of feature switch definition? Feature no, switch. just oh, right yeah. below where the, the screen was. Yeah. <laughs> The, so um, this is one one more detail. Like I mentioned, that the the trimming support relies on this string feature uh, switch that you have to pass to IL link or native AOT. So there needs to be a way to link these things with that string. And feature switch definition is just uh, what ties the attribute type to that string. And we called it feature switch definition rather than something like um, um, feature name, because we thought uh, that that might be more um, more generic, like in case we wanted to represent the feature switch in a different way in the future, like a, a type instead of a string, or if we wanted there to be a default where the, but, but currently the convention is that the string name is supposed to match the type of the, the property. So if, if in the future we wanted to uh, make this default kind of, if we wanted in the future to make this actually an implicit default, then it would look weird to have an empty feature name attribute. So maybe feature switch definition, you could imagine getting rid of the constructor the, the constructor argument and just sticking it on the requires dynamic code attribute on its own, but open to naming suggestions. Do you apply the switch on the attribute basically, right? Yeah. And again, what that does is it tells trimming when this string feature is set to false, then all of the guards associated with this at attribute should return false. It's funny to me that you put it on the attribute because logically I would assume that you know you like if you write runtime feature dot is dynamic code support you want that to be statically false with the string based configuration right yeah but no you basically say like oh yeah let me look up the attributes of this property that points to the attribute and then the attribute says oh yeah I'm this thing that you know you just looked at basically <laughs> that's true. Uh... At the bottom, uh, under alternative designs, there's an example of what it might look like if we use um, strings instead. I, I think this is kind of what you were getting at, if we put the string directly in feature check. Well, I mean, more like because the string basically mirrors the property name. Like it kind of like, it, basically it models the capability API you would call to give you a true false answer, right? Versus the, the attributes are kind of like strings in the sense that they're static, right? They, 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 they don't vary versus the property that can return true or false, like by definition, varies. Mm 
So it kind of makes sense that, you know, because that's the thing you want to pin. Mm -hmm. It seems like those are the two things you want to connect. But I guess that's also the way we have designed it in the past. So that's just, you know, maybe we will do it differently for new switches. Yeah, there, there was also a question of, do you put feature check onto the um, property or do you put it onto the attribute? And my thinking was, if we, we would, for feature check attribute, we would have allow multiple calls. Uh, so that says that a static Boolean property can only be a feature check for one attribute type. Whereas if we put feature check attribute on the like requires dynamic code attribute, then you could imagine defining multiple attribute types that point to the same property, which we don't really want. Right. This way allows you to define multiple properties that are defined by the same attribute type. But we we were thinking that that's a little bit more reasonable. So the attribute type would be the source of truth, and that's also why feature switch definition, uh, the string is is kind of tied to that because that's the old, it's like the source of truth. Right. I mean, I don't really have any objections to what you're proposing here. It's just I always, I think whenever we design something, I kind of want to see the usage in the context of like two or three to actually say, okay, is the shape that we have here covering that, right? Yeah. Um, and that's the thing for, you know, when I wrote the capability spec originally, that was the thing I struggled with because we didn't really have any capability APIs, so I just, you know, made some up. And then, yeah, of course, I designed it so that it works nicely with my proposal. But um, now we have actually decent amount of them, as you pointed out in your in your design document. And um, uh, I mean, I'm inclined to believe you that it will work for all three of them, but it would still be important, I think, for us to go through that. Mm -hmm. Because, well, it's hard to change, as you said, like the the thing with the attributes is like you want them to be as simple as possible, right? And like as minimalistic as possible. But there are definitely some some things like, you know, do we have strings in all cases? Do we have defaults for them? Um, you know, should it be strings? Should it be types? Uh, uh, because it would also be unfortunate if you now have to define a bunch of attributes just to make the API work, right? That's, that that's true, yeah. Um, there was some thinking about what it could look like to extend this in a few directions. like. Currently, we say that if a, fe if a feature uh, string is false, that means the feature is unavailable and the Boolean property returns false. Like those are all tied together. Um, like we could imagine passing an extra um, Boolean to the feature check attribute to invert that, uh, among other kind of extensions. The, the biggest pivot that I think we need to decide now is kind of do we use a string representation or an attribute type in the feature check attribute? Like what is the representation? What is the source of truth for the the thing that defines a feature um, and we think it makes sense to use the attribute type because we already have like requires feature attribute it requires unreferenced code dynamic code it requires assembly files so that seems like yeah it's funny know. because it, like you know this particular feature the the started the other way around right like the only thing we had for a long time was just the two boolean properties and then when we started to do linking that's when we actually defined requires dynamic code attribute that, that, that came after actually which properties so the so the runtime feature is dynamic code support and is dynamic code compiled are older than the attribute right you know to some extent that just makes your point stronger because it just shows that it works right and that, that what you said kind of like uh you know we kind of want an attribute even if we didn't have one right <laughs> so it's uh so maybe that's the way we want to do it um I mean, to some extent, like if you look at how we would do it in documentation, right? If you if you look at a particular API that says, you know, I I need dynamic code, then you look at the attribute, right? So the user mostly looks at the attribute, and then and then the question is, well, how do I check that whether it's dynamic code? Well, you either put the attribute on yourself, or you, um, you know, you call this dynamic thing runtime feature that is dynamic code supported, right? Yeah. And so in that sense, it kind of, you know, the user has to reason about both usually. So maybe that's fine. And I assume that in in your world, the only reason why you would need feature guard is if you have something like is dynamic code supported and is dynamic code compiled where one just implies the other. But if you have a super simple thing, then you would only need feature check attribute, the actual attribute itself, and then plus the feature switch definition if you have one, right? So but you might get away with just feature check attribute on the uh, yeah, whenever the dynamic 
if um, you don't need but, trimming support. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just as a note, feature guard is the one that personally I'm more interested in. Like, I, I already see a bunch of use cases for feature guard where libraries are defining their own features that are specifically designed to remove uh, trim incompatible code that's annotated with requires and reference code. So we, we really need a use case for guarding requires and reference code with a library that introduces its own feature. Because they would apply the attribute to their own attributes and say like, oh, by the way, if, if you find this attribute that implies the presence of the other one, basically, right? Yeah, whether they use an, their own attribute or not, even if they just define their own property, like sometimes. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. same way. And it kind of makes sense. We had the same thing with the platform compat analyzer where we just started with telling people to use operating system dot is Windows, but then lots of people had their own ways to, to, to check operating systems. And so we ended up shipping these guard attributes so they can annotate their own stuff while you're writing everything. That's what, yeah, I got the name guard from, from that. Yeah, yeah. That as to the, whether the things currently called check and guard take types or strings, I like the compile safety of type and I, I don't think we would ever be in a situation where we have an inverted layer, which would be the only reason I think not to do it. So I, I like the types better than strings. The only thing I don't, I'm, I find a bit confusing is that in the attribute definition, one says feature type and one says feature type, a feature attribute type. Yeah, yeah we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, but if, if we if we believe they should both be attributes, then we should just align them. If not, that's what I was asking. Like, does the name imply that you would use something that wouldn't be an attribute? Oh, that's just a typo. I should have made those the same. All right, then <laughs> that makes sense. Okay, so uh, regarding names, I'll start at the bottom because it's where my cursor is. Uh, the the example you show of using feature check shows calling into app context try get switch, and this is called feature switch definition. So it seems like they should use instead of calling it feature name, it should use the same term as app context try get switch does, which is switch name. Okay, that seems reasonable to me. Because you're not defining the name of a feature, you're defining the what's the app context switch that's associated with this. Yeah. And why do you need to know that? Why do you need to know the, the like, name? Why does, I mean, presumably the linker reads the feature switch definition attribute and extracts that string, but like, what do you do with that information? Oh, yes. Uh, so what it does is then if the linker is invoked with that string set to false, then it knows to treat the guards for this attribute type uh, as false, and so it can do code dead branch elimination. Oh, so we actually say that the app contact <laughs> is input to the linker? No, the linker would read the feature switch definition attribute. That would be the source of truth for the linker. And it's true that you have to be careful currently to uh, match that up with the try get switch call. Uh, and that's that's already the case today. Like you have to stick this string both in the XML and in the try get switch. We've talked about maybe making that less error prone uh, by maybe a, uh, a a code generator to implement to implement the feature check. But I didn't want to scope that into this proposal. So I guess what I'm asking is like, which direction are you reading? Are you basically saying by looking at the feature switch definition, the linker knows that the call to app context try get switch with that string name is the same as requires that I make code attribute, therefore you know whether it's true or false statically? Not quite. Uh, the linker sees, if the linker sees a call to is dynamic code supported, it looks at the feature check attribute, so it sees requires dynamic code attribute, right. which gives it the feature switch definition, and that's what the linker reads. Uh, and when it sees that string set to false, then regardless of the implementation of is dynamic code supported, it will treat is dynamic code supported as false in that case. So the, the feature switch definition and the linker settings kind of win over whatever the code is. And That's what I was asking originally. So like, is it logically true that when you invoke the linker, you also give it a bunch of switches that you assume to be either true or false? Yeah. I see. So the, so we are linking for particular app context. I was under the impression that the app context is always dynamic. But 
Okay, so you're... yeah, this is kind of how this is the mechanism we use to substitute that. Uh, the okay. epic context is dynamic, and the linker doesn't doesn't exactly know that. So instead, we substitute the implementation. And then, so what's the purpose of feature in general? Like, it would only be about basically being able to know that certain features are on or off, so we can link them out, right? Yeah, both for getting rid of warnings for prim incompatible or AOT incompatible code, and also for size reasons. But does your feature then also come with analyzer that basically says like, well, you invoked something that says it requires this thing, but you didn't check? Yes, and we already have uh, an analyzer that supports, or currently just supports requires and reference code, dynamic code, and assembly files. But it would. Uh, and I'm proposing for now not to actually generalize the analyzer support because we would need to come up with kind of a uniform warning code. Um, but we already have analyzers for those three. So the proposal would be to just make those three work for now. But I want to say, like, presumably the analyzer could just work by looking at those attributes and not actually care about dynamic code at all, right? It would just be, you know, yeah. it would just know the attributes and then therefore should be able to give you that experience. To me, that would be important to at least do so that we know that the shape of the attributes is sufficient to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, the analyzer can uh, the analyzer can for the most part be independent of what actually the feature is. For dynamic code, it has to interact with some intrinsics, but uh, and I, I already have a prototype also that kind of I think it proves out that this concept at least is enough to express what the analyzer needs. Because I would kind of assume, I mean, like the, I mean, maybe I'm naive because I mean, maybe I don't understand the feature enough, but like, it sounds like there's two consumers of these attributes. One of them is the linker, and then the other one would be the analyzer, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. And that would be part of the generalization, I guess. Otherwise, the attributes are not super useful if you just, if the analyzer is just basically reasoning about the, the you know, the dynamic code. APIs directly rather than going via these new attributes. Yeah, and it needs to be able to reason about uh, libraries that introduce their own guards for dynamic code too. So the, the analyzer really needs feature guard, uh, and then the linker really needs feature switch because it's the one doing the branch elimination. And so I think they make sense together. Yeah. So who needs feature check? Because it feels like feature, the place that feature check is could just say feature guard and everything would still be the same truth table. Um, so the difference is that feature check will be defined by the feature name and when trimming. But I guess you're saying, like, could we just replace all of those with, with feature guard? Yeah. Because if it said feature guard requires dynamic code attribute, then you'd just, you'd know if this is not true, this can't be true, so make it perma false and move on. Otherwise, leave the body. And that seems like check and guard are then doing the same thing, other than one of them is allow multiple true and the other's not. Yeah, that might work. That's a good question. I'm not. Like maybe one potential future problem with that is if we did try to implement a source generator uh, for feature check that generates the app context implementation, like that could be problematic. So, like, you're right. I don't see any problems with any like I, I can't come up with any immediate problems, but there might be some. Especially yeah, I mean, if feature check was going to generate a default body, if it can, interceptors I guess can do things. Um, yeah, so if feature check is intended to be used for a source generator later, then that would either make sense to introduce with a source generator, or maybe make sense to introduce now. I'm just asking are they actually redundant and if I mean, their the plans to be the difference between feature guard and feature check is that feature check is the bottom thing right it's like the base case yeah. i mean feature check does express the intent that if somebody wants to just check whether the feature is disabled they should use the property that has feature check not some random property that has feature guard so Yeah, just check. Like for operating system APIs, you know, you could make the same argument. You could say operating system dot is Windows should have a, a a platform guard attribute applied to it, but it doesn't because we treat those methods as intrinsic, basically, to the analyzer. Uh, 
but that might be because we did that before we had the guard attribute. So maybe if you had them from day one, I mean, it is an interesting question whether you can get rid of it entirely. Okay, so yeah, we have feature type versus feature attribute type. Um, I don't think anything's actually like no runtime instantiation of this attribute, which almost doesn't matter. But no, none of it is going to care that this is actually an attribute type. So I think to me, just feature type is better, and you can make the analyzer yell if you didn't point it at an attribute. Yeah, I agree. We've also talked about like maybe in the future we loosen things up and allow non-attribute types. So I agree. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Have you have you reviewed this with Booyah? Sorry. Have you reviewed this with Booyah? No. Uh, no. Yeah, you should probably ping her because she was the person that did all the work for the platform compat analyzers. And she might have some insights into whether that holds up or not. But yeah, I, I think API-wise, it makes sense. I mean, the only thing I'm unsure of is like the feature, like the like the usage of the terminology feature, mm -hmm. because it, it seems like I mean we're describing something that sounds super generic, but it, like it does seem to me like what you're describing here is also somewhat specific, which is basically just basically yeah describing islands of 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 areas that might not be available, right? Which, I mean, you could still use the word feature for that, but it does seem more specific than that. Because I I, I don't know, yeah, I, I guess I don't know what else you would use it for. Yeah, I mean, yeah. do we want to, I would say compile time feature to try and indicate this isn't just API decoration, but mm -hmm. compile time is probably not the right term for it. Yeah, I don't know exactly what it is, but I mean, it does seem to me basically what you're describing here is like functionality that might be unavailable at one time because you linked it out basically. And so that's why we have capability APIs so you can check for those. Uh, but yeah. One reason I like feature is I think there's an analogy between this and um, like preprocessor features where the, the main difference is that we can't, we were using attributes to represent like a pound if, uh, and you can't put an attribute onto a block of code that's supposed to be guarded. So we're using the property uh, as kind of a proxy for it. And then right. instead of being eliminated at compile time, we're doing it at trim time, but otherwise it's very similar to, right. to that. This is really similar to conceptually supported OS platform attribute and supported OS platform guard attribute. Yeah, it is. The, 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 the key difference there is that here it makes no sense to have a version. And the other difference is that conceptually, none of this, I mean, maybe that's the part of it I'm wrong, but my understanding is that in this area, this is always static data versus the, the, the OS you don't really know <laughs> until you run on it, right? I mean, you knew which OS you were building for, of course, but that doesn't mean that you run on that one, right? You might run on the later version of that. Well, even then you might not know what, you might be building a general cross-platform library that has optional light up for an OS if you happen to be running on it. That's true, you could actually be open-ended, that's true. But I mean, the same is true and this here, is right? Kind if you're building of... a, if you're building a, a, a new get library, right, at, at that point, you still don't know. You have to still link it in the context of an app to actually know. And I think this is really the same thing in that regards, is you have a feature that you want to support, and you don't know if the user is going to say, allow this to be a dynamic or treat it as a constant value. Uh, allow the trimmer or, or the JIT via... Uh, tiered compilation, for example, to treat it as a constant value later. And so this is really allowing your, it's allowing you to specify, I've got this thing that I want to check so that the, so that AOT understands. And then the user can additionally uh, provide their own helper methods 
uh, in which case they would put the thing that's equivalent to support an OS platform guard saying, I'm a guard check for this feature switch. And then allows the yeah. users to specify, I want this switch on or off in the app to take advantage of it then. So I, I think it's really just a parallel. But yeah. it, it's taking supported OS platform and making it for the, the same kind of things we use runtime config switches for, or app config yeah. switches for in the BCL. Yeah, I would agree with that. Right, except the 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 purpose of this with the three that are proposed seem more concentrated on the linker understanding it can delete things as unreferenced or as unachievable code. So like we shouldn't go around so a bunch of the new crypto APIs don't work on all platforms so they have is supported. So but like we're not going to go around we're not going to slap one of those is supported with a I'm a feature check because like there's no app config associated feature and I'm just concerned that the a little concerned that the current name is so general sounding that people will think that they should decorate them like system designs component model like this isn't describing I'm a feature it's describing like I'm something that can be removed in AOT that is right that's... but th that is conceptual so so the only reason this is needed for AOT is because AOT doesn't have the it doesn't have tiered compilation with before AOT, we didn't have this consideration because you would just declare a static read-only variable. You'd initialize it however you want it from an environment variable, from an app config switch, from reading a file off disk or the registry, and then the JIT on upon upon hitting the second tier, or if it's compiling a method after the static constructor has definitely run, is able to treat that value as a constant and do dead code elimination. With AOT, you don't have the ability to depend on that initialization. So you want to be able to compile the AOT program and say, treat it as if this value had been initialized with true or false so that you can take advantage of it. So it's taking an existing behavior that we've had with the JIT for years and making it available to AOT as well. And it really does apply to any type of app config switch that you could think of. A user could use this for saying, I want the default build to not include debug diagnostics. But if the user really wants to, they can go and enable that additional debug diagnostics with my already shipped library for their AOT application. That way they get the perf, they get the validation, and otherwise it's it's uh, otherwise it can be be completely trimmed out. Right, but I'm I'm just should we introduce something in the name that says that this is for trimming or AOT or linking or like that it's not just go paint all of your APIs with I'm a feature because then right so uh, it's a fair fair uh, concern and we actually intentionally made it fairly general because while it is uh, for us motivated by trimming support it seems like it because it does parallel the the support OS platform analyzer and we also have uh, for example David Breton has an analyzer um, for annotating runtime code depending on what kinds of intrinsic support uh, it, it requires and it seems like the semantics that uh, that these attributes capture and the kinds of analyzer warnings you get uh, are very uniform across all of these um, so it, it was intentionally designed so that you could extend this to um, arbitrary attributes but I don't know whether we would actually want to introduce them for a given feature area that makes sense. so on the, for that example for David's intrinsics one that we use in Corelib the expectation is those custom attributes will go away and they could just use this in, I'm not saying that that we would necessarily implement that but yeah the the semantic model is basically the same so I think we could if we wanted to it would the there would probably still be some intrinsics that are like like analyzer intrinsics where the um, where, where the analyzer requires special support um, rather, like just this attribute model might not be enough for every kind of feature. There might be some that needs some special that, casing. Generally that's speaking. sort of my point or my question is, you know, anytime we talk about introducing interfaces or abstract classes or in general abstractions, we talk about the abstraction needing to be validated by multiple implementations and multiple consumers. And what you just described is basically saying that we have created an abstraction or kind of you know one attribute system to rule them all that could be used for all these different ones at which point if that's the reason we've chosen a general purpose name i think we need to validate that it can actually be used for 
more than it, this one purpose. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I know I one example, speaking of intrinsics, is the actual hardware intrinsics. We currently kind of specially encode those in CoreLib and in the linker uh, to know that they can be treated as constant true or false and things like that. And in if this were general purpose, <laughs> I'd imagine that ideally we could update all of the custom logic to really kind of um, thread it through uh, with a normalized feature flag. That way we don't have to maintain a custom support. We could use the general feature. Right, but from what's here, that would mean that you'd need to go make an attribute of, you know, x86, 64, SSE4, and to point this at, and then now you need to define an app context switch that says, I guess, even if my processor has that, don't use it? Uh, yes, yeah, so we functionally have that already. It's .NET enable... SSE equals zero. And one for every single ISA. Which for IoT makes sense, right? Because you compile for a chip, right? And you don't know which, I mean, you, you decide, I want to prereq SSE four. And so I don't care about having fallback code for SSE two, right? But I think the question then becomes, if you do that, you know, to Tanner's point, I mean, there's like, I don't know, like 6,000 intrinsic APIs are we putting an attribute declaration on freaking all of them and then also have all these attributes defined? Probably not, right? You'd put it on the is supported uh, property oh. and then presumably on the class saying no, well, all the me all the other members in here require but That's not this. how this works here. My understanding is the way it works here is you would have a requires SSE2, basically all the... So we design hardware intrinsics that basically each requirement is expressed as one class and that class has an is supported attribute right but that's that's our convention right this thing doesn't know that right so the way you would do it here is you would have to say each of those you have a corresponding attribute that we then put on the, on all the methods to say i require this other thing in the same way that we say if you call reflection apis it says requires dynamic code attribute um and then you know th th that that seems noisy given how intrinsics are that, that there's like 6,000 of them, right? Well, so we actually have that for the VCL because the trimmer can't analyze all the stuff today. And so we have magic attribute that we put on some of our internal helpers that goes and says, I require SSE or advanced SIMD, depending on which platform you're targeting. Can you so think of an example for, for, for the implementation where that, what that looks like? Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm actually trying to find one now. But then most of our code actually just has the if is supported check. And so uh, everything works fine from that perspective. Yeah, I think I think the difference will be that there's not one attribute type for each intrinsic, but that you can, if I remember correctly, I think you can specify multiple uh, like instruction set subsets in one attribute definition, which it's true that this doesn't capture. So I, I would, you know, we tried to strike a balance where the, the name here is sufficiently generic that it, like, because the semantics here line up very much with, with what we would want for the intrinsics analyzer, but for, for this to actually work with the given analyzer, we might need to extend it in some directions. Like I mentioned earlier, um, it might need to take an extra Boolean or in general, it might need to take some extra data um, so that one attribute isn't the feature, but is like a feature schema I mean, so I, 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 let me just zoom on for a moment, right? So, like, I think it's fair to say that almost all of our, like, you know, whether it's operating system or whether it's the intrinsics or whether it's the requires dynamic code thing, they all have very similar patterns in how they're being used. But what you're basically doing here is you're saying, okay, we generalize this pattern into these three attributes. But then the only reason why these two attributes are usable or available is because they're reused across them, right? So if we end up in a world where, you know, the linker knows about requires dynamic code and knows about, you know, is dynamic code supported methods already, so meaning it's custom for this one, then we have another thing that's custom to, uh, you know, intrinsics, and then we have already have another thing that's custom to operating systems, then we don't need these three attributes. We already have the attributes to describe every feature area on its own. So I think the question from Stephen kind of is similar to what I said earlier. Is like you know if we if we believe this is generalizable, then 
you know, it truly should be generalizable and we should be using it most of the time. It's fine to say that certain areas like intrinsics is just, okay, that's different enough that we don't use it there, but, you know, the abstraction has to pay for itself that it's reused enough to carry its weight. Otherwise, you know, I would say let's not have them and let's just say, yep, you know, they all, they all model as a pattern, but they're not using the same attribute definitions, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, and I wanted to just differentiate between the linker supporting these three existing attributes like uh, requires dynamic code. That's one thing, but the link, the, the analyzer also now needs to be able to support a third party library defining its own property that serves as a guard for the existing that is dynamic code supported. So I agree with that, but that's what I'm saying earlier. So that we already have that for operating systems, right? We have the operating system guard attribute that kind of allows the third party to write their own guards, but it's still specific to operating systems, right? So you could imagine yeah. that we do a requires dynamic code guard attribute. I mean, I don't know what the, that's the right name, but like, you know, but it will be specific to this area, not, not generic, right? That makes sense. And, and, and I think the question is, you know, is this the shape that would actually be reusable for another area like that, right? And I think that's kind of, I think the homework for us to do to say, okay, could we in principle do it? And I think with hardware intrinsics, I mean, the answer might be yes, but we don't want it because it's super noisy in terms of attributes. Um, and that might be fine, but then we have to at least have to find a few other areas where we actually would or even yeah. would you know do it for real i have another example that might be coming up which is uh, unsafe code like there have been ideas floating around of annotating unsafe code with an attribute um, that propagates to callers in the same way that this does so that might be another use case which i think has the same kind of semantics i don't know i don't know if you'd have a, a feature check necessarily but the attribute types would propagate up the same way right yeah so but it, are you saying that we like we're open to the idea, but we need to go collect some examples and say, yes, these three examples kind of match the. Yeah, because I mean, if you zoom out, I mean, this is really the same as an interface, right? So the interface only makes sense when you have an if you have more than one implementation, but also if you have a consumer that can actually reason about things by just looking at the at at the interface, right? So you, you basically you need to have, you know, producers and you have to have consumers, and they and and. If you can't have one side, then our answer has always been, well, an interface, yes, it codifies a contract, but if there's no consumer for the contract, we don't need the interface. Right? That's the example of iClonable. Right? There's no code that you write against an iClonable, and so you might as well not have it and just say, yeah, there's a pattern that we have in the BCL, something is clonable, you just have a clone method. Right? You don't need an interface for that. And in the sense, that's the same here. You define a bunch of attributes which kind of implies there's some consumer that knows nothing about the features themselves, it just looks at these attributes mm -hmm. and can do something useful like an analyzer or the linker or whatever, right? And so that kind of implies that, well, there's multiple parties that would apply these attributes and you get some semantics out of that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think my answer would be if we, if we don't have that, we shouldn't have these attributes. So you're looking for an example of a consumer that uh, analyzes solely based on these attributes, but doesn't have any intrinsic knowledge of a specific attribute type. Correct, because as soon as you need that all the time, then well, that kind of seems to suggest that the, that the abstraction is leaky, right? Okay. In which case, you don't want them, you actually want to say, you know, you always define your own attributes for your own area, and then there is a pattern in terms of naming, so for example, the guard thing, and then the the, the switch thing and maybe the check thing and then we just say this is how you should do those but you know we wouldn't have a generalized attribute for that I see yeah one I think it does at least need to generalize in terms of a library introducing its own feature switches to influence uh, dead code elimination so like at least for trimming it needs to generalize and then also for feature guard but those you I think your point is well taken that it's those are still specific to trimming and you could make them specific to requires unreferenced code or requires dynamic code. Yeah, you would just have guard attributes mm -hmm. for them that basically open up for third parties. Oh, well, I guess we, I think, uh, is, I'm thinking if I can think of an example. We, we have, we definitely have some feature areas where we trim them uh, simply for size reasons. And they're not uh, guarding like unreferenced code calls. They're just uh, substituted false for size reasons. Right. Yeah. So that would be another one. Right, but like for the 
you know, so Tanner gave the link to comp exactly depends on which I guess would be feature guard. Um, but then we look at like the thing it leaks to, which doesn't have an equivalent of what's my runtime switch. So now what's the analyzer going to do? Like, oh my god, you're pointing to a thing that we don't know how to re like. Well, that, the, the current model feels kind of exactly like it's today. set up as the as the linker and the app context and the right and and so again that's where it's like I can see how it could be used by other things, but really this attribute model to me feels like this is linker knows I can delete stuff if and. If you go back to the uh, comp depends on, there was an ex is supported check, so I was imagining, and I'm not an expert here, but I was imagining that you could annotate the is supported check with uh, feature. So it would say feature check and points to the same thing, but there's no, there's no notion of an app context switch that you're going to go ask to find out if this is turned on. Which is fine, and the you know the linker doesn't understand the app context. The linker just understands this boolean gets sub, like this boolean property gets substituted. So your analyzer is not going to be angry that feature guard and feature check are pointing at a type that doesn't have a feature switch definition. We could. I, I mean, we presumably define way. the feature switch definition we have internally. In that case, we have an existing internal feature switch for it. So we would just put the relevant attribute to say the is supported is the feature check. Uh, the feature switch definition is the the actual. Can, uh, environment variable name that we we check for um, in the runtime, and then we we'd say that this method depends on this function without doing the is supported check itself. That's what comp exactly depends on does, and so any callers need to make sure they're calling it from a context where is supported has been done. Well, but that's not feature garden that's feature demanded or assumed uh. well but it also would mean that every single method that is an intrinsic right now would have to have a requires well like the requires dynamic code we said could be slapped on a class and it means right. what? The, 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 this is very much like supported os platform where you would end up putting so so comp exactly depends on SSE two is like saying supported OS platform x eighty six SSE. And yeah, then but, keep them, but that would also apply OS to the is supported API itself, the, right? Is supported <laughs> is supported OS platform guard attribute is effectively what the is supported check is, and so you'd put that on the is supported property that returns true or false. Yeah, I mean the... And then the the additional thing this adds mm. is the feature switch definition, which allows you to define what linker switch it gets mapped to so that you know how the substitution works. We'd have to make the analyzer smart enough to say that the is supported is allowed to be inside the box that is guarded by the is supported. But... That's kind of what I'm getting that's at, true. because I don't think that's how it works today. At least on the OS side, we basically just say everything in there is not required. Right. And that would have to change to everything unless it itself is marked as feature check. Yeah, which probably is reasonable. I think the the yeah I I think that's kind of what I'm saying is that that kind of thinking that we just had that's I think what we should do with this feature and actually see whether it holds up like that. If it does, then I think I'm supportive of it. If it doesn't, then not so much. So would it suffice to kind of go uh, look at details of how the comp exactly depends on analyzer works and sort of scope out that it it matches the same uh, shape and it would this could capture that? I think so. Yeah. As an example, okay. and then I mean, but uh, so if we do AOT today, do we not have a way to actually? I mean, it sounds like what Tanner was saying. There is a way to say, you know, assume that SSE four is available, right? I right. Mean, yeah. Yeah. So, we, I don't so know we've if we got, use it for we, FSC. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we've got we've got the we've got the environment variable that allows you to turn off existing support, and then. Uh, we have the ability to, uh, in in the actual native AOT compiler, we have the ability to specify, here's the instruction sets I support. And so turn this on and treat this as the new baseline target for right. 
and those are those in this world would be feature switches, right? That would be input to the AOT pipeline. But yeah, I, I that's, assume that's that effectively what they are. That the ISA baseline is specified differently than the current feature switch of allowed dynamic code references. That's yes. the question, right? Yeah, so we, the... we provide a dedicated command line switch for right. the instruction sets today because and, that's a And so then the question is thing. how like how does it get unified on this? Yeah. And so if you can so I think I'm okay with the general name as long as we can apply it to at least two technology concepts. And then if we're also putting it in for something like the SHA-3 APIs we put in of like, you know what, I just don't, I don't even care if the OS underlying supports it, just say it's off. And if that's a thing that we think we should be able to generally do with his supported things, and maybe not all of them, but in general, and we figure out what the shape looks like, then, then we say, here's how we would do it for this thing if we wanted to do it, but we don't want to do it. And so I think yep. that three things is really a good, you now have a generic enough You've shown that your pattern works in general, and so you can now take a general name. So, so kind of if, just to make sure I, I understand, there are kind of two paths forward. Either we make the name something more specific to trimming, but we're overall happy with the, the behavior and the semantics and the API shape. Or we go and prove out that it uh, is general enough to capture like three analyzers that don't necessarily have trimming support. And yeah. then we would be happy with the general name. Or you know to understand the the notion because if if this is always going to be taken advantage of by the trimmer, mm -hmm. then we should just understand how the various components that would be able to take advantage of it are going to use it. Well, and, I mean, you could say that you know if 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 you have a generic analyzer that can look at them, right? Then you know mm -hmm. even if you don't do the trimming thing, it would still be available in your case, right? When you say like, oh, you're expected to do is supported before you call the API, right? Yeah, or or you know, mark yourself as you require this feature, right? Which you know is kind of how everything else works in the system. So then, even if you don't trim, just being able to say like, you know, you don't forget to call, makes sense, right? Yeah, the, the behavior of the way that the attributes bubble up and the behavior of a check acting as a guard, I think that that like that intentionally was designed so that it doesn't have anything to do with trimming. Right. And that, well, but the... that behavior makes sense, but I think the question was, as I understood it, does that actually map to existing analyzers, like the specific API shape? Right, because the current it's... definition, like you said guard is only available on a property, which means it's yeah. intended to be used as... I'm nesting, I'm a Boolean property nesting somebody else's check state inside me. Yep. And this is, which is not the same as, uh, you know, required OS or supported OS or whatever we call it, or the compile exactly depends on, which is this feat or even requires unsafe code attribute. It's this feature is needed in this method and this structure doesn't define that third piece. It sort of assumes these are pointing at it, but then you also said it can point at a non-attribute type. So that's, well, I think, that's uh, where that, that sort of missing... Yeah, I, I was suggesting that we initially restrict it to pointing at an attribute type uh, for that reason. Right, but the in like the intrinsics case... It wouldn't matter. It yeah. would... I would expect to generally be pointing at you know one of these types of I'm the and, I'm the ISA intrinsics container, which yeah, is the not an attribute, and so then it would need a it would need the version of the comp exactly depends on AKA ISA required. Yes, yeah. The difference is that it takes the attribute uh, takes an extra argument that specifies kind of the the type that represents the feature. Yeah. So we would need to extend the API so that um, it takes an extra argument for that type. But that's kind of like, I mean, you, 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 basically what you just said is true though. Like, I mean, you said like that doesn't exist today, but that's basically what feature check is meant to be. 
but like feature guard is kind of the same thing in the sense well, that these are both these both go on the boolean properties to say is this these will return false unless this feature is available and right, but, the but versus this, but the so demand we, which is what this comp exactly depends on is this is feature demand I, I think that the attribute that you yes. pick the method both says that the method uh, requires the feature and that it's allowed to use the feature. But it your definition of feature, feature guard is only applicable to properties, meaning it couldn't be specified here. Yeah, that's but so, but you could imagine we relax that, right? You could just say any member is fine. Right, but then instead of instead of it's like effectively if guard is supposed to be dead or link time replaced with false or if it gets an override of link time replaced with true um, that's not the same as saying like this entire function should be deletable oh. it should it does work that way uh, for trimming so the the way it works is uh, you get analyzer warnings that tell you if you have an unguarded call to a method that's annotated yeah uh, and if you don't have such a call then because the call sites are eliminated, trimming will also eliminate all those methods. Because logically what you do is you just forward the check to the caller, right? You basically say the caller was supposed to check. Sure. I'm just, I feel that this is missing a third or fourth thing, which is feature demand, which would be I, I the, think the, the, the meta attribute if you to... don't define an extra, because one place of feature demand is this is requires unsafe code attribute. And you're saying the feature demand is the thing that they're pointing at, but in the case of the primitives or the the ISA minimums here, this is basically feature demand type of SSS type of SSS E3. Yeah. And if I there was just a generic feature demand that could say I'm playing with these other two things, then you you've contained you make now a self-contained system. Yeah, I think what you're pointing to is that in the SSS E3 example, like the feature demand is SSS E3, right? Yeah. We don't have an it requires SSS E3 attribute. Instead, we have a comp exactly depends on SSS E3. So the attribute is parameterized. Right. So if we have two ways we could solve that, we could either introduce a requires SSS E3 attribute, or we could generalize the feature guard so that it takes an extra type that says like SSS E3 is the thing that defines the feature. Yeah. So there, I, I think the, the point seems to be that we might need to extend this uh, API if we want to cover all kinds of these, all of these patterns. Uh, at the same time, I want to restrict this initially to something simple. There are, there are different directions we'd be interested in extending it to, like the inverted polarity, for example. So do we feel that this is approved with caution or needs work of prove it out and then we'll sign off? I would mark it as needs work, yeah. Okay. But the only work that's required is prove that you can make it work for three things. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. I mean, I, I mean, to me, but, but I think this is similar to an interface, right? You want both sides. You want you want the implement you want three implementations, but you also want one side that consumes it generically. So, which in my case, I think would be an analyzer. Yeah. Would it would it be enough to say we provide this generic analyzer, and the library can introduce these attributes and then get the warnings from our analyzer? Yes. Okay. Which is basically the thing that Jeremy has, right? So we have these like crypto algorithms that fundamentally are 
they have all these supported APIs and they basically call into the US or you know the crypto stack and say, do you support this algorithm? And you could imagine a world where even if you do zero trimming, you still want the caller to, to you always want to inform the caller, hey, you call these crypto APIs, but you're supposed to call is supported somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you don't do that. Okay, I'll go look at the crypto APIs and see if maybe that's the third uh, example. Yeah, and yeah. they're logically very, very similar to the intrinsics because they basically have static methods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it says that in the crypto case, it's simpler because in the intrinsics, we have this super convoluted inheritance hierarchy to to, to model derived in, you know, uh, ISAs basically, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, that that is, you know, I think if you make intrinsics work, you basically have to have them all covered. Any but yeah, the, the pattern is usually is supported. SHA-3 underscore types will be a, yeah. a root that will all have it is supported. Okay. Hash provider dispenser. That's an internal type, right? Yeah. It's our stringly typed way of talking to the OS. Oh, um, actually, sorry, one more comment about the switch name is uh, I don't think that the app context currently mentions the word switch, so we're kind of inventing this terminology. No, right? I got it literally out of the app context API. Yeah. Oh, try get switch. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> try get switch, switch name. So. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah. And I mean, looking at the usage numbers here, like I'm not sure that that is a... <laughs> No, but it, if it, I mean, if the call is generally expected to be associated with a call to app context, uh, try get switch, then yeah. that means it's probably specified in config somewhere under like app context switches. And so then this is, and then it's switch name, whatever. Uh, I think, I think the way it's passed to app context is in the runtime config JSON. I think it's called runtime. Uh, I know there's an MS build runtime host configuration option. Because right, like for framework at least, the the config for it was app context switch override. So switch is sitting right there in the name. And then we okay. started most of the ones in framework with switch dot, which seems to have been lost in core. But the anyway, like so if when yeah, so it becomes sense. generic, <laughs> if it's not always based on app context, then maybe switch name changes to something else, but I got that based off your example. Thanks. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, did I push the button? I pushed the button, but I didn't change to... Needs work. Which, again, the work is just demonstrate that it can apply to something other than just requires dynamic code yeah. preferably to other things all right thank you all righty well with that uh, 25 minute extension of the meeting uh, I think it's yeah I said something yesterday like I hope it doesn't take half an hour it took almost an hour <laughs> I mean so they did ask for an hour for this in email. Uh, yeah. Pretty close to right. So, <laughs> um, I suppose. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us online. Uh, next week, I'm only going to check because I got burned this week. Uh, I'm pretty sure next week we're on normal time. Uh, also, on Thursday at our normal 10 o'clock start time, uh, we'll be doing more of the ARM intrinsics. So it's even reflected on our calendar. If you go to apireview.net slash schedule, it's actually there as well. Yeah, but you didn't change the start time of today's until like yesterday when had I looked at the calendar it would have been like, oh, there's a conflicting meeting that literally all of us are going to be in. So I guess not true. Brennan wasn't in it. Don't ruin my awesome narrative in fact. But yes, yeah, so we'll see you on, in February. Um, on our same .NET time for real on our same .NET channel. <laughs>
Auf Wiedersehen. Bye, bye.